Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, Part 6, Chapter 2. Ah, these cigarettes, Porfiry Petrovich ejaculated at last, having lighted one. They are pernicious, positively pernicious, and yet I can't give them up. I cough. I begin to have tickling in my throat and a difficulty in breathing. You know, I, I am a coward. I went lately to Dr. Bree. He always gives at least half an hour to each patient. He positively laughed, looking at me. He sounded me. Tobacco's bad for you, he said. Your lungs are affected. But how am I to give it up? What is there to take its place? I don't drink. That's the mischief, <laughs> that I don't. Everything is relative, Rodion Romanovich. Everything is relative. Why? He's playing his professional tricks again, Raskolnikov thought with disgust. All the circumstances of their last interview suddenly came back to him, and he felt a rush of feeling that had come upon him then. I came to see you the day before yesterday in the evening. You didn't know? Porfiry Petrovich went on, looking around the room. I came into this very room. I was passing by, just as I did today, and I thought I'd return your call. I walked in as your door was wide open. I looked round, waited, and went out without leaving my name with your servant. Don't you lock your door? Raskolnikov's face grew more and more gloomy. Porfiry seemed to guess his state of mind. I've come to have it out with you, Rodion Romanovich, my dear fellow. I owe you an explanation and must give it to you, he continued with a slight smile, just patting Raskolnikov's knee. But almost at the same instant, a serious and careworn look came into his face. To his surprise, Raskolnikov saw a touch of sadness in it. He had never seen and never suspected such an expression in his face. A strange scene passed between us last time we met, Rodion Romanovich. Our first interview, too, was a strange one, but then, and one thing after another. <laughs> this is the point. I have perhaps acted unfairly to you. I feel it. Do you remember how we parted? Your nerves were unhinged and your knees were shaking, and so were mine, and, you know, our behavior was unseemly, even ungentlemanly. And yet, we are gentlemen above all in any case, gentlemen. That must be understood. Do you remember what we came to? And it was quite indecorous. What is he up to? What does he take me for? Raskolnikov asked himself in amazement, raising his head and looking with open eyes on Porfiry. I've decided openness and spatter between us, Porfiry Petrovich went on, turning his head away and dropping his eyes, as though unwilling to disconcert his former victim and as though disdaining his former wiles. Yes, such suspicions and such scenes cannot continue for long. Nikolai put a stop to it, or I don't know what we might not have come to. That damned workman was sitting at the time in the next room. Can you realize that? You know that, of course, and I am aware that he came to you afterwards. But what you supposed then was not true. I had not sent for anyone. I had made no kind of arrangements. You ask why I hadn't? What shall I say to you? It had all come upon me so suddenly. I had scarcely sent for the porters. Uh, you noticed them as you were not, I dare say. An idea flashed upon me. I was firmly convinced at the time, you see, Rodion Romanovich. Uh, come, uh, I thought, even if I let the one thing slip for a time, I shall get hold of something else. I shan't lose what I want anyway. You are nervously irritable, Rodion Romanovich, by temperament. It's out of proportion with other qualities of your heart and character, which I flatter myself I have to some extent divined. Of course, I did reflect even then that it does not always happen that a man gets up and blurts out his whole story. It does happen sometimes if you make a man lose all patience, though even then it's rare. I was capable of realizing that. If I only had the fact, I thought, the least little fact to go upon, something I could lay hold of, something tangible, not merely psychological, for if a man is guilty, you must be able to get something substantial out of him. One may reckon upon most surprising results indeed. I was reckoning on your temperament, Rodion Romanovich, on your temperament above all things. I had great hopes of you at that time. But what are you driving at now? 
Raskolnikov muttered at last, asking the question without thinking. "'What is he talking about?' he wondered distractedly. "'Does he really take me to be innocent? "'What am I driving at? "'I've come to explain myself. "'I consider it my duty, so to speak. I, "'I want to make clear to you how the whole business, "'the whole misunderstanding arose. "'I've caused you a great deal of suffering, Rodion Romanovich. "'I'm not a monster. "'I understand what it must mean for a man who has been unfortunate, "'but who is proud, imperious, and above all impatient "'to have to bear such treatment.' I regard you, in any case, as a man of noble character and not without elements of magnanimity, though I don't agree with all your convictions. I wanted to tell you this first, frankly and quite sincerely, for above all, I don't want to deceive you. When I made your acquaintance, I felt attracted by you. Perhaps you will laugh at my saying so. You have a right to. I know you disliked me from the first, and indeed, you've no reason to like me. You may think what you like, but I desire now to do all I can to efface that impression and to show that I am a man of heart and conscience. I speak sincerely. Porfiry Petrovich made a dignified pause. Raskolnikov felt a rush of renewed alarm. The thought that Porfiry believed him to be innocent began to make him uneasy. It's scarcely necessary to go over everything in detail, Porfiry Petrovich went on. Indeed, I could scarcely attempt it. To begin with, there were rumors... Through whom, how, and when those rumors came to me, and how they affected you, I need not go into. My suspicions were aroused by a complete accident, which might just as easily not have happened. What was it? Huh. I believe there is no need to go into that either. Those rumors and that accident led to one idea in my mind. I admit it openly, for one may as well make a clean breast of it. I was the first to pitch on you. The old woman's notes on the pledges and the rest of it. That all came to nothing. Yours was one of a hundred. I happened, too, to hear of the scene at the office from a man who described it capitally, unconsciously, reproducing the scene with great vividness. It was just one thing after another, Rodion Romanovich, my dear fellow. How could I avoid being brought to certain ideas? From a hundred rabbits, you can't make a horse. A hundred suspicions don't make a proof, as the English proverb says. But that's only from the rational point of view. You can't help being partial, for after all, a lawyer is only human. I thought, too, of your article in that journal. Do you remember, on your first visit, we talked of it? I jeered at you at the time, but that was only to lead you on. I repeat, Rodion Romanovich, you are ill and impatient. That you were bold, headstrong in earnest, and had felt a great deal I recognized long before. I, too, have felt the same, so that your article seemed familiar to me. It was conceived on sleepless nights, with a throbbing heart in ecstasy and suppressed enthusiasm. <laughs> and that proud, suppressed enthusiasm in young people is dangerous. I jeered at you then, but let me tell you that, as a literary amateur, I am awfully fond of such first essays, full of the heat of youth. There is a, a mistiness and a, a chord vibrating in the mist, your article is absurd and fantastic, but there's a transparent sincerity, a youthful, incorruptible pride, and the daring of despair in it. It's a gloomy article, but that's what's fine in it. I, I, I read your article and put it aside, thinking as I did so, that man won't go the common way. Well, I ask you, after that as a preliminary, how could I help being carried away by what followed? Oh, dear, I am not saying anything. I'm not making any statement now. I simply noted it at the time. What is there in it? I reflected. There's nothing in it that is really nothing, and perhaps absolutely nothing, and it's not at all the thing for the prosecutor to let himself be carried away by notions. Here, I have Nicolay on my hands with actual evidence against him. You may think what you like of it, but it's evidence. He brings in his psychology, too. One has to consider him, too, for it's a matter of life and death. Why am I explaining this to you? That you may understand and not blame my malicious behavior on that occasion. It was not malicious, I assure you. <laughs> Do you suppose I didn't come to search your room at the time? I did, I did. <laughs> I was here when you were lying ill in bed. Not officially, not in my own person, but uh, I was here. Your room was searched to the last thread at the first suspicion. 
but umsonst. I thought to myself, now that man will come. Will come of himself, and quickly too. If he's guilty, he's sure to come. Another man wouldn't, but he will. And you remember how Mr. Rosumahin began discussing the subject with you? We arranged that to excite you, so we purposely spread rumors that he might discuss the case with you. And Mazumahin is not a man to restrain his indignation. Mr. Zamatov was tremendously struck by your anger and your open daring. Think of flirting out in a restaurant. I killed her. <laughs> it was too daring, too reckless. I thought so myself. If he is guilty, he will be a formidable opponent. That was what I thought at the time. I was expecting you. But you simply bowled the Zamatov over and, well, you see... It all lies in this, that this damnable psychology can be taken two ways. Well, I kept expecting you, and so it was you came. My heart was fairly throbbing. Ach. Now, why need you have come? You laughed, too, as you came in. Do you remember? I saw it all plain as daylight. But if I hadn't expected you so specially, I should not have noticed anything in your laughter. You see what influence a mood has. Mr. Rezumahin, then. Ah, oh, that stone. That stone under which the things were hidden. I seem to see it somewhere in a kitchen garden. It was in a kitchen garden, you told Zamatov, and afterwards you repeated that in my office. And when we began picking your article to pieces, how you explained it. One could take every word of yours in two senses, as though there were another meaning hidden. So in this way, Rodion Romanovich, I reached the furthest limit, and knocking my head against the post, I pulled myself up, asking myself what I was about. After all, I said, you can take it all in another sense if you like, and it's more natural, so indeed. I couldn't help admitting it was more natural. I was bothered. No, I'd better get hold of some little fact, I said. So when I heard of the bell ringing, I held my breath and was all in a tremor. Here is my little fact, thought I. And I didn't think it over. I simply wouldn't. I would have given a thousand rubles at that minute to have seen you with my own eyes when you walked a hundred paces beside that workman after he had called you murderer to your face and you did not dare to ask him a question all the way. And then what about your trembling? What about your bell ringing in your illness in semi-delirium? And so, Rodion Romanovich, can you wonder that I played such pranks on you? And what made you come at that very minute? Someone seemed to have sent you by Jove, and if Nikolai had not parted us... And do you remember Nikolai at that time? Do you remember him clearly? It was a thunderbolt, a regular thunderbolt, and how I met him. I didn't believe in the thunderbolt, not for a minute. You could see it for yourself, and how could I? Even afterwards, when you had gone, and he began making very, very plausible answers on certain points, so that I was surprised at him myself, even then I didn't believe his story. You see what it is to be as firm as a rock. No, thought I. Morgenfru, what has Nikolai got to do with it? Rosumahin told me just now that you think Nikolai guilty and had yourself assured him of it. His voice failed him and he broke off. He had been listening in indescribable agitation as this man, who had seen through and through him, went back upon himself. He was afraid of believing it and did not believe it. In those still ambiguous words, he kept eagerly looking for something more definite and conclusive. Mr. Razumihin, cried Porfiry Petrovich, seeming glad of a question from Raskolnikov, who had till then been silent. <laughs> oh, but I had to put Mr. Razumihin off. Two is company, three is none. Mr. Razumihin is not the right man. Besides, he is an outsider. He came running to me with a pale face. But never mind him. Uh, why bring him in? To return to Nikolai, would you like to know what sort of a type he is? How I understand him, that is? To begin with, he is still a child and not exactly a coward, but something by way of an artist. Really, don't laugh at my describing him so. He is innocent and responsive to influence. He has a heart and is a fantastic fellow. He sings and dances, he tells stories, they say, so that people come from other villages to hear him. He attends school, too and laughs till he cries if you hold up a finger to him. He will drink himself senseless, not as a regular vice, but at times when people treat him like a child. And he stole, too, then, without knowing it himself, for how can it be stealing if one picks it up? 
And you know, he is an old believer, or rather a dissenter. There have been wanderers in his family, and he was for two years in his village under the spiritual guidance of a certain elder. I learned all this from Nicolai and from his fellow villagers. And what's more, he wanted to run into the wilderness. He was full of fervor, prayed at night, read the old books, the true ones, and read himself crazy. Petersburg had the great effect upon him, especially the women and the wine. He responds to everything, and he forgot the elder and all that. I learned that an artist here took a fancy to him and used to go and see him, and now this business came upon him. Well, he was frightened. He tried to hang himself. He ran away. How can one get over the idea that people have of Russian legal proceedings? The very word trial frightens some of them. Whose fault is it? We shall see what the new juries will do. God grant they do good. Well, in prison, it seems, he remembered the venerable elder. The Bible, too, made its appearance again. Do you know, Rodion Romanovich, the force of the word suffering among some of these people? It's not a question of suffering for someone's benefit, but simply one must suffer. If they suffer at the hands of the authorities, so much the better. In my time, there was a very meek and mild prisoner who spent the whole year in prison, always reading his Bible on the stove at night. And they read himself crazy, and so crazy, do you know, that one day, apropos of nothing, he seized a brick and flung it at the governor, though he had done him no harm. And the way he threw it, too, aimed it a yard on one side on purpose for fear of hurting him. Well, we know what happens to a prisoner who assaults an officer with a weapon, so uh, he took his suffering. So, I suspect now that Nicolai wants to take his suffering, or something of the sort. I know it for certain from facts, indeed, only he doesn't know that I know. What, you don't admit that there are such fantastic people among the peasants? Lots of them. The elder now has begun influencing him, especially since he tried to hang himself, but he'll come and tell me all himself. You think he'll hold out? Wait a bit. He'll take his words back. I am waiting from hour to hour for him to come and abjure his evidence. I have come to like that, Nikolai, and I'm studying him in detail. And what do you think? Eh? He answered me very plausibly on some points. He obviously had collected some evidence and prepared himself cleverly, but on other points, he is simply at sea, knows nothing, and doesn't even suspect that he doesn't know. No, Rodion Romanovich, Nikolai doesn't come in. This is a fantastic, gloomy business, a modern case, an incident of today when the heart of man is troubled, when the phrase is quoted that blood renews, when comfort is preached as the aim of life. Here we have bookish dreams, a heart unhinged by theories. Here we see resolution in the first stage, but resolution of a special kind. He resolved to do it like jumping over a precipice or from a bell tower, and his legs shook as he went to the crime. He forgot to shut the door after him and murdered two people for a theory. He committed the murder and couldn't take the money. And what he did manage to snatch up, he hid under a stone. It wasn't enough for him to suffer agony behind the door while they battered at the door and rung the bell, no. He had to go to the empty lodging, half delirious, to recall the bell ringing. He wanted to feel the cold shiver over again. Well, that, we grant, was through illness, but consider this. He is a murderer, but looks upon himself as an honest man, despises others, poses as injured innocence. No, that's not the work of a Nikolai, my dear Rodion Romanovich. All that had been said before had sounded so like a recantation that these words were too great a shock. Raskolnikov shuddered as though he had been stabbed. Then who... Then, is the murderer? He asked in a breathless voice, unable to restrain himself. Porfiry Petrovich sank back in his chair, as though he were amazed at the question. Who is the murderer? He repeated, as though unable to believe his ears. Why, you, Rodion Romanovich, you are the murderer? He added, almost in a whisper, in a voice of genuine conviction. Raskolnikov leapt from the sofa, stood up for a few seconds, and sat down again without uttering a word. His face twitched convulsively. Your lip is twitching, just as it did before, Porfiry Petrovich observed almost sympathetically. You've 
been misunderstanding me, I think, Rodion Romanovich, he added after a brief pause. That's why you're so surprised. I came on purpose to tell you everything and deal openly with you. It was not I who murdered her, Raskolnikov whispered like a frightened child caught in the act. Oh, it was you. You, Rodion Romanovich, and no one else, Porphyry whispered sternly with conviction. They were both silent, and the silence lasted strangely long, about ten minutes. Raskolnikov put his elbow on the table and passed his fingers through his hair. Porfiry Petrovich sat quietly waiting. Suddenly, Raskolnikov looked scornfully at Porfiry. You are at your old tricks again, Porfiry Petrovich. Your old method again. I wonder you don't get sick of it. Oh, stop that. What does that matter now? It would be a different matter if there were witnesses present. But we are whispering alone. You see yourself that I have not come to chase and capture you like a hare. Whether you confess it or not is nothing to me now. For myself, I am convinced without it. If so, what did you come for? Raskolnikov asked irritably. I ask you the same question again. If you consider me guilty, why don't you take me to prison? Oh, that's your question. I will answer you point for point. In the first place, to arrest you so directly is not to my interest. How so? If you are convinced you ought... Look, what if I am convinced? That's only my dream for the time. Why should I put you in safety? You know, that's it, since you asked me to do it. If I confront you with that workman, for instance, and you say to him, were you drunk or not? Who saw me with you? I simply took you to be drunk, and you were drunk too. Well, what could I answer, especially as your story is a more likely one than his, for there's nothing but psychology to support his evidence. That's almost unseemly with his ugly mug. Well, you hit the mark exactly, for the rascal is an inveterate drunkard, and notoriously so. And I have myself admitted candidly several times already that that psychology can be taken in two ways, and that the second way is stronger and looks far more probable, and that apart from that I have as yet nothing against you. Though I shall put you in prison, and indeed have come quite contrary to etiquette to inform you of it beforehand, yet I tell you frankly, also contrary to etiquette, that it won't be to my advantage. Well, secondly, I've come to you because... Yes, yes. Secondly, Raskolnikov was listening breathless. Uh, because, as I told you just now, I consider I owe you an explanation. I don't want you to look upon me as a monster, as I have a genuine liking for you. You may believe me or not. And in the third place, I've come to you with a direct and open proposition that you should surrender and confess. It will be infinitely more to your advantage, and to my advantage too, for my task will be done. Well, is this open on my part or not? Raskolnikov thought a minute. Listen, Porfir Petrovich, you said just now you have nothing but psychology to go on. Yet now you've gone on mathematics. Well, what if you are mistaken yourself now? No, Rodion Ramanovich, I am not mistaken. I have a little fact even then. Providence sent it to me. What little fact? I won't tell you what, Rodion Romanovich. And in any case, I haven't the right to put it off any longer. I must arrest you. So think it over. It makes no difference to me now, and so I speak only for your sake. Believe me, it will be better, Rodion Romanovich. Raskolnikov smiled malignantly. That's not simply ridiculous. It's positively shameless. Why? Even if I were guilty, which I don't admit... What reason should I have to confess when you tell me yourself that I shall be in greater safety in prison? Ah, Rodion Romanovich, don't put too much faith in words. Perhaps prison will not be altogether a restful place. That's only theory, and my theory, and what authority am I for you? Perhaps, too, even now, I am hiding something from you. I can't lay bare everything. <laughs> and how can you ask what advantage? Don't you know how it would lessen your sentence? You would be confessing at a moment when another man has taken the crime on himself and so has muddled the whole case. 
Consider that. I swear before God that I will so arrange that your confession shall come as a complete surprise. We will make a clean sweep of all these psychological points of suspicion against you so that your crime will appear to have been something like an aberration, for in truth it was an aberration. I am an honest man, Rodion Romanovich, and will keep my word. Raskolnikov maintained a mournful silence and let his head sink dejectedly. He pondered a long while and at last smiled again, but his smile was sad and gentle. No, he said, apparently abandoning all attempt to keep up appearances with Porphyry. It's not worth it. I don't care about lessening the sentence. That's just what I was afraid of, Porphyry cried warmly and, as it seemed, involuntarily. That's just what I feared, that you wouldn't care about the mitigation of sentence. Raskolnikov looked sadly and expressively at him. Ah, don't disdain life, Porphyry went on. You have a great deal of it still before you. How can you say you don't want a mitigation of sentence? You are an impatient fellow. A great deal of what lies before me? Of life! What sort of prophet are you? Do you know much about it? Seek and you shall find. This may be God's means for bringing you to him. And it's not forever the bondage. The time will be shortened, laughed Raskolnikov. Why? Is it the bourgeois disgrace you're afraid of? It may be that you are afraid of it without knowing it because you are young, but anyway, you shouldn't be afraid of giving yourself up and confessing. Ah, hang it! Raskolnikov whispered with loathing and contempt, as though he did not want to speak aloud. He got up again as though he meant to go away, but sat down again in evident despair. Hang it, if you like. If you've lost faith and you think that I am grossly flattering you. But how long has your life been? How much do you understand? You made up a theory and then were ashamed that it broke down and turned out to be not at all original. It turned out something base, that's true, but you're not hopelessly base. By no means so base. At least you didn't deceive yourself for long. You went straight to the furthest point at what bound? <laughs> How do I regard you? I regard you as one of those men who would stand and smile at their torturer while he cuts their entrails out, if only they have found faith or God. Find it and you will live. You have long needed a change of air. Suffering, too, is a good thing. Suffer. Maybe Nikolai is right in wanting to suffer. I know you don't believe in it. But don't be overwise. Fling yourself straight into life without deliberation. Don't be afraid. The flood will bear you to the bank and set you safe on your feet again. What bank? <laughs> How can I tell? I only believe that you have long life before you. I know that you take all my words now for a set speech prepared beforehand, but maybe you will remember them after. They may be of use some time. That's why I speak. It's as well that you only killed the old woman. If you'd invented another theory, you might perhaps have done something a thousand times more hideous. You ought to thank God, perhaps. How do you know? Perhaps God is saving you for something, but keep a good heart and have less fear. Are you afraid of the great expiation before you? No, it would be shameful to be afraid of it. Since you have taken such a step, you must harden your heart. There is justice in it. You must fulfill the demands of justice. I know that you don't believe it, but indeed life will bring you through. You will live it down in time. What you need now is fresh air. Fresh air. Fresh air. Raskolnikov positively started. But who are you? What prophet are you? From the height of what majestic calm do you proclaim these words of wisdom? Who am I? I am a man with nothing to hope for, that's all. A man, perhaps, of feeling and sympathy, maybe of some knowledge, too, but my day is over. But you are a different matter. There is life waiting for you, though, who knows? Maybe your life, too, will pass off in smoke and come to nothing. Come. What does it matter that you will pass into another class of men? It's not comfort you regret with your heart. What of it that perhaps no one will see you for so long? It's not time, but yourself that will decide that. Be the sun, and all will see you. The sun has before all to be the sun. Why are you smiling again at my being such a shiller? I bet you're imagining that I am trying to get round you by flattery. Well, perhaps I am. <laughs> oh, perhaps you'd better not believe my word. Perhaps you'd better never believe it altogether. 
I'm made that way, I confess it. But let me add, you can judge for yourself, I think, how far I am a base sort of man and how far I am honest. When do you mean to arrest me? Well, I can let you walk about another day or two. Think it over, my dear fellow, and pray to God. It's more in your interest, believe me. And what if I run away? Asked Raskolnikov with a strange smile. No, you won't run away. A peasant would run away. A fashionable dissenter would run away, the flunky of another man's thought. For you've only to show him the end of your little finger, and he'll be ready to believe in anything for the rest of his life. But you've ceased to believe in your theory already. What will you run away with? And what would you do in hiding? It would be hateful and difficult for you. And what you need more than anything in life is a definite position, an atmosphere to suit you. And what sort of atmosphere would you have? If you ran away, you'd come back to yourself. You can't get on without us. And if I put you in prison, say, you've been there a month or two or three, remember my word, you'll confess of yourself and perhaps to your own surprise. You won't know an hour beforehand that you are coming with a confession. I am convinced that you will decide to take your suffering. You don't believe my words now, but you'll come to it of yourself. For suffering, Rodion Romanovich, is a great thing. <laughs> well, never mind my having grown fat. I know all the same. Don't laugh at it. There's an idea in suffering. Nikolai is right. No. You won't run away, Rodion Romanovich. Moskolnikov got up and took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich also rose. Are you going for a walk? The evening will be fine if only we don't have a storm, though it would be a good thing to freshen the air. He, too, took his cap. Porfiry Petrovich, please don't take up the notion that I have confessed to you today, Raskolnikov pronounced with solemn insistence. You're a strange man, and I have listened to you from simple curiosity. But I have admitted nothing, remember that. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I'll remember. Oh, look at him. He's trembling. Don't be uneasy, my dear fellow. Have it your own way. Walk about a bit. You won't be able to walk too far. If anything happens, I have one request to make of you, he added, dropping his voice. It's an awkward one, but uh, important. If anything were to happen, though indeed I don't believe in it and think you are quite incapable of it, yet... In case you were taken during these 40 or 50 hours with the notion of putting an end to the business in some other way, in some fantastic fashion, uh, laying hands on yourself, uh, it's an absurd proposition, but you must forgive me for it. Uh, do leave a brief but precise note, oh, only two lines, and mention the stone. It will be more generous. Come, till we meet. Good thoughts and sound decisions to you. Porfiry went out, stooping and avoiding looking at Raskolnikov. The latter went to the window and waited with irritable impatience till he calculated that Porfiry had reached the street and moved away. Then he, too, went hurriedly out of the room. The end of Part 6, Chapter 2 of Crime and Punishment Read by Rick Kistner for Lit to Go on the Web at fcit.org